Okay, I'm gonna talk to you about shoulder pain, shoulder injuries, and some discomfort in the shoulder. We can get injured when we exercise, throwing sports, etc., etc. But we can also have a lot of shoulder problems just from, like I talked about, being sedentary, at the desk, anything rolling forward. Um, sometimes what people don't know is that uh, the arm is a ball and socket, okay? It's a multi-planar unit because the arm, for example, knee, just goes back and forth, you know? Wrists are multi-planar. The shoulder is one of the most mobile joints in the body. It needs to go everywhere, okay? Shoulder, ball and socket. What happens if we are forward like this, if you're having bad posture like this, you really, it's gonna be hard for you to do a full circle. So some people are like, oh, my shoulders are killing me, I can't, but their posture is forward. So if your shoulder is a dull and achy type of pain, one of the things you need to be aware of is you need to be aware of, first you're like, oh, I can't move my arm much. Try it, try to get yourself better, assume better posture, and then see if you can do more of a fluid movement. Sometimes it's pretty shocking because I myself have pretty cranky shoulders, but if I'm sitting here like this and I try to do this, I, I really can't get there. I've got to go out to the side. But if I'm tall, when I do this, the full thing moves, okay? Ball and socket. People talk about, I have a rotator cuff injury. Let me show you what that is. I've had people say, oh, I don't have a rotator cuff. It was taken out in surgery. Now, that's not true because your arm would fall off. The only thing that's really holding the arm bone, this bone, onto your shoulder are the rotator cuff muscles. There's some tendons, etc., etc. This is a model of the shoulder, and it's the back of the shoulder, like this, okay? The reason it's called the rotator cuff, it's three or four muscles that rotate the shoulder, and it's kind of a cuff, okay? Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis lives against your rib cage, okay? They have to all work together for the right ranges of motion. What happens with the most common tendon that gets irritated is the top one here. It's called supraspinatus. It can get irritated because it has to slide under this little tiny joint right here underneath the AC joint, okay? This is the model with the muscles. This is the same thing with no muscles. Underneath here, some people have that little bump, that muscle's got to slide under here, and if you're forward, all the time, it's gonna close it down and it's gonna get irritated. So, um, you can have a real traumatic injury where you really tear some of the muscles, you know, a first degree, third, second degree, third degree sprain. For example, pretty much across the board, first degree sprain or strain, it's like a, a few fibers, okay? Second degree, maybe 30, 40%, third degree, set 50 to 75%, a fourth degree sprain might be a complete rupture to where you would need surgery. Most often, if you have a rotator cuff injury, it can often be really fixed, repaired with uh, the right type of exercises, the right type of home care, okay? So, we know your shoulder is held onto the body by the rotator cuff. We know the rotator cuff is four muscles that work together. Um, what often happens is, we're here on our phone, we're here on this. The shoulder has a tendency to be pulled forward. Another part of the shoulder that gets irritated is the front, okay? A rotator cuff injury is often, you'll feel it back here, you might feel it out here, you might feel it out here, you're gonna feel it in certain movements, okay? If your shoulder pain is primarily right here in the front, that is not, most often, is not a rotator cuff injury. That is a part of the shoulder, but it, what is really happening if this thing hurts right here, people are like, it hurts right here. That is an injury or a repetitive use problem that is irritated the bicipital tendon. So your bicep is here, right? It's got a tendon, which is, for example, here's your model. Here's my tendon. It sits here, but it sits deep under everything else. So, sorry about that. You don't get bicipital tendonitis, which means inflammation of a tendon, from doing biceps. You get it from a rounding of the shoulders or 
some exercising like upright rows irritated, okay? So if this is irritated here, it's because your shoulders are rolling forward. The pec is a big muscle and it, it'll rub right across here. So achiness here, especially sharp pain in here, is an inflammation of the bicep tendon caused by bad posture, anything where your shoulder's rolling forward. People, let's say, another thing I've noticed with the stay home quarantine is like everyone's doing push-ups. And now this hurts, okay? This hurts because if you turn the arms in here, there's a little bump on this humerus on the bone. When you turn it in, it's gonna rub that tendon. So again, if you're sedentary, pecs are short, right? You're sitting watching TV on the phone. Then you're gonna jump up and do 10, 20, 100 push-ups it's gonna go here and irritate this. So people come in, now my shoulder hurts from doing push-ups or pull-ups, most often push-ups. So that's another reason you can't just get off the couch and do 10, 20 push-ups without opening up the chest, without stretching this out, without putting movement in there. So if you're gonna get off the sofa and start doing some push-ups, you've gotta get movement in the shoulder first. You've got to keep the pecs open a little bit. And with that, you know, don't just swing the arms. That's just too, too dynamic. Just gentle stretches, open, back, open, back, okay? Then start out with five to 10 push-ups. Even if you're a big, strong guy, if you've not been doing push-ups and you just start doing them, it's gonna go somewhere, okay? Same thing, let's say you're not doing push-ups, but this part hurts. I noticed a couple of my friends, they're like, I'm laying on my side all the time, looking at my phone. Shoulders rolling forward, this guy's getting pinched, rotator cuff's getting stretched out. So putting movement in the joint is key. Raising your chest to good posture is key. Now let's say you wanna do some strengthening, okay? Let me show you what, some, what we can do with some bands, okay? One thing you can do is, is if you have a band at home, you can attach it somewhere. Now, if you have a band at home, you can attach it somewhere. What I suggest is you attach it at waist height. Okay, you wouldn't want it up, wouldn't want it down. And I'm gonna show you basically just the movements that you wanna do to help strengthen the rotator cuff muscles, okay? There's a tons that can be done with dumbbells, etc. but I've noticed, we can't buy any dumbbells, they're all sold out. Stick with some bands, okay? You're attaching it somewhere, tie it on a doorknob, something. You hold the band, elbow is right tight like this, okay? You wanna find an area that is, you want to start the movement with your arm against your body. What you do is the band is attached here, you hold here, elbows against your body, and you go out. One, two, three, four, five, come back down, okay? One, two, three, four, five, come back down. Key points, lock the wrist. This does not occur. And this does not occur, okay? You don't wanna do that. You want the elbow to stay here, and you, don't, you can't really go much further than that because the rotator cuff stops. If you let your arm come out and migrate, it's not even doing the right exercise. So again, chest high, a little bit of tension here, out, one, two, three, four, five, again. And you wanna resist it, don't move, don't just go like that. I've seen people do that, okay? Feel it out on the way out, feel it on the way in. One of the things is we don't really need to do, you can if you want, it's already strong on the in, okay? So. It's not a bad exercise, it's just not gonna help you that much, okay? I've also seen some of the things that I don't think are the greatest are, if you're totally healthy with no problems, no aches or pains, this might not be bad. But you know, you, sometimes you see people with dumbbells and they're doing this, all right? That is okay, but it's putting movement into the joint that's, you wouldn't really ever do this in a normal day activity that it's, it mimics, so this movement here with a band is similar to this, but you know, don't go grab five, 10 pound dumbbells and do this, because it's not really an, an effective exercise, in my opinion, for anything. One of the tips I think about telling people when they're doing movements is, would your body do this in a day-to-day -day basis? If you, if you saw a rock on the ground, you're gonna pick it up. You know, you're just gonna pick it up. You're not gonna do some weird, I'm gonna pick up the rock like this, right? So if you're doing something that, that you would naturally do, like in caveman days, that is okay. Same thing, I've seen some exercises at the gym where people are doing a weird contortion and you know they may have a really hard twist and they got a, a weight and they're doing things like this. Highly conditioned people would have no problem, but you would, might not wanna start, I've had a few patients come in 
starting some kettlebell work and they'll they move to an advanced movement to where they pick up a heavy dumbbell and then they flick it up but they haven't done anything to loosen the lats and or the back or the core and we would never in a day-to-day -day basis say oh there's a hundred dollar bill on the ground let's pick it up like this and throw it in the air so um think about that like if it's seeming pretty advanced and you're like, wow, I, this is really hard to balance this thing, you may think it may not be the best way to move. Um, there's some great exercises with kettlebells, but I've seen a lot of people um, do them improperly. It's causing a lot of problems. Just make sure if you're doing them, maybe have somebody who's educated show you how to do it. Don't grab the heaviest weight. And uh, sometimes I've noticed weighted movements with rotation can really irritate your, irritate your low back. So. If you're used to these movements and you're an athlete or you do it, from here to here will not bother you. But again, if you went from a sedentary position and you haven't done any even rotation, you wouldn't want to add a weight to it, okay? Same thing um, with deadlifting and uh, bent over movements is, even if you've been weight training for a long time, if you took a couple months off of weight training and now you're back at the gym and you want to do bent over rows or something, your back is most fragile in a flexed position, weight bearing, okay? So if you're not ready for it, you wouldn't want to just go pick up a dumbbell or a bar and start doing this, okay? You wouldn't want to do something like this unsupported if your back is not prepared for that. You would want to do two, three, four weeks of like the little lumbar stabilization. You would want to make sure the lats are open. You want to make sure, again, this is a bad thing. You never really want your back to be rounded, fragile. Straight back or curvy back to do movements like this are good. If you're planning on doing some kind of a standing row move, a stance like this is okay. But again, don't hunch like this. Keep your back kind of arched. Don't over arch it, but flexion, weight bearing, bad for the back. That's how people really, they blow out a disc. They're like, they got something heavy and they're trying to pull it or push it and their back's like this, it's gonna go there. So. You find something that you're gonna that's heavy you want to push or pull you know get your back like this put maybe a, a stance like this so then when you pull it's your whole body versus just like that because people will come in and they'll say people will come in and they're like I, I, I blew out my back putting on my shoe and it's not the putting on the shoe that blew out the back and now this movement it's just the last straw and you're like I can't get up you know it's not often I was pushing a truck and I blew out my back. It's the little things like I'm flicking my hair and I pull my neck. So it's the repetitive things you've done before that have made us fragile. Talking about the shoulder, keep movement in it. Keep the pecs open. You can even just do during the day, let's say you are working a lot at home. Let's say you are on the computer a lot. Pecs are tight, this and that. Just sit up every hour, even just bring your shoulders back. Just even bring your shoulders back. Loosen this part up. Try to have better posture. If you want to do some of the rotator cuff movements, that's okay. Acupuncturists really feel that heat is best and don't recommend ice. I support that theory, but I also have different ideas that might help, okay? So I always say, if you, if you have a pain on a scale of zero to 10, 10 is the most pain, zero is no pain. If your pain is seven, eight, nine, that means there's a lot of inflammation, which means there's swelling and you gotta get that out of there. So you need to ice the region, okay? Now 15, 20 minutes, a couple times a day. It doesn't matter what body part, okay? If your back is achy, super stiff, oh, you can't move, you gotta ice it, okay? That stops the swelling, because swelling and inflammation kinda go like this. You can't have one without the other. So um, people are like, is it inflamed, is it swollen? I'm like, probably. So if you're dull and achy type of a pain, uh, let's say two, three, four on that pain scale, that's when heat is really good. Um, if you have something sprained an ankle, it's swollen, you got to ice it, okay? Your knee's big and swollen, you got to ice it. Shoulders, great, ice it. Sometimes you get tendonitis here that's like, oh, I, I've been weight training too much, and let's say you're back now you're training biceps, triceps. You get tendonitis here or here, you got to ice it. Sometimes, if you have the ability to do so, heating it for 10 or 15 minutes is great. It brings blood flow, which brings oxygen, which helps it heal. And then you follow up with 10 more minutes of ice, which then like, hey body, 
stop sending all that stuff there. We don't want you to be too inflamed. And so heat 10 or 15 minutes, followed up by another 10 minutes of ice, okay? That, that across the board is a pretty good approach when it comes to whether you should use heat or ice. Um, if you don't know and you're in a lot of pain, I always I defer to ice because that's my preference. If you are a person who suffers from a lot of headaches or you just start feeling that headache coming on, or let's say you did a bunch of weights and the traps are really achy and the base of your skull it hurts all the time. Let's say you have forward head. If you ice the base of your neck often, like lay on an ice pack, just kind of get it up here, it'll really decrease the amount of neck pain you can have. It'll decrease the intensity or frequency of your headaches. Um, if you have a headache and you, if you just don't know what to do, you know, go lay on an ice pack 15, 20 minutes again. Heat is okay, but neck, headaches, ice is great.